Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here and that I have the privilege of visiting with you about shoes. Ever wonder what kind of shoes you might be? I know it's not the typical question you might get asked in a sermon. That's okay. Stick with me. Just think, when we look at our shoes or other people's shoes, it's the choice of the day. I have sandals on because it's warm outside. Maybe we wear boots to walk in the rain or work in the garden. Just for fun, what kind of shoes are you? My kids and I had a lot of fun coming up with what kind of shoes we might be. Practical and don't care what other people think. Fancy heels, leather work boots, or a combination like myself. Maybe some leather Birkenstocks with a touch of glitter. Consider with me for a moment. Do we judge other people for their shoes? Well, maybe if the shoes are extremely elaborate or unusual, we might think, wow, I want a pair of those. Or what's wrong with that guy? He's wearing those weird shoes. Either one is a type of judgment. I'm purposely using the analogy of shoes just because it brings our mind close to home. Shoes are common to us. It's a part of our culture. It protects our feet, like Amy said, and for some, a treasure that they spent a lot of time on. And so is judging. You see, our brains are wired to judge. You surprised? Judgments are designed to keep us safe and save time. Imagine the tremendous need for judging from our great, great, great grandparents when they were still alive. They didn't have time to ponder a decision when a wild animal was charging at them. Their judgments had to be in the moment, careful, and at times split second to save their lives. Which animals were dangerous, which were helpful, and which could be used for food. Also, time was of the essence. They had short lives and needed food and shelter. Judging their surroundings and watching the birds saved them a lot of time when determining which berries to eat for dinner and where to sleep. They had to judge, evaluate, consider, decide their life or death judgments. Judgments can keep us safe and save time. This happens when a stranger approaches us. Are they friend or are they foe? Last weekend, my husband and I went out to dinner for our anniversary. Don lovingly made a reservation at one of our favorite restaurants downtown. After our delicious, delicious dinner and visit, we decided we wanted to take a little walk before we headed home. As we walked, we saw a man who had stepped away from his group outside seating to have a cigarette. And then he started walking towards us and invited us to crash a wedding party across the street. I laughed and thought, he must just be making idle conversation in a time when we're all a little bit lonesome. We judged the idea and this stranger's forward manner. It was not something we wanted. We politely refused his offer and continued our walk, amused and glad we declined. We judged the situation, not the man. Oh, wait. We did judge the man. We talked about how we thought maybe he was just having a little fun in a time when we could all use more joy. In other words, we can choose how to judge. It's not judging that's the problem. Because remember, that's designed to keep us safe and save time. In this case, not only did it save us time, it kept us from offending a lovely wedding party. As you know, the example could be much harsher. That's on purpose. Because most of the time, our judging is really close to home. It's judging people like, who are like us. We're judging ourselves, those that we live with, our family, our friends, and neighbors. It's important to realize that there's more than one type of judging. And that's where many people get confused, especially when it comes to teasing apart God's opinion about judging. There are two main types of judging. One is the situational judging. It's called situational attributes when we judge to see if it's safe or if we can save time. When we ask ourselves, do we wanna be a part of this idea? Like going to the wedding party uninvited, that was a hard no. The other types of judging is personalized judging. 
when we give attributes to that person's character and personality. We believe or judge that the behavior that we're seeing is due to their personality, their character. Like the man is bad because he invited us to crash the party. Or when our neighbor doesn't wave back to us, then we say, they're unkind. This difference is very vital. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew when it says we're not to judge. It's like making a brick wall that gets in our way to love, joy, and our best life. It also blocks our ability to connect with God and others. After decades of helping people with their life and faith, I've seen so much heartbreak over judging. When we judge a person, we make life so much more difficult. We break relationships and hurt our personal faith as well. Each day we decide what shoes to wear. It's a simple choice, right? So that lets us know we have the power over our thoughts to make a choice. God talks to us about how powerful we can be if we can let go of judgments that degrade people. When it comes to others, we truthfully don't know all the factors of their life. We have not walked in their shoes, so we really don't know their answers. If they followed our, our advice, which is a form of judgment, with our limited understanding, we can really make a mess of their life. Let's be real. Most of the time, we have a hard enough time with ourselves than all the thoughts swirling around in our head. After almost 30 years of marriage, my friend's husband made some terrible choices, and abruptly, she's newly divorced. Now she's getting a flood of advice from her church friends. They are inserting themselves in, with their opinions, and then they're offended when she isn't taking their advice, their judgments, leaving her feeling more hurt and alone than she already did. It's not their intention to hurt her, but they are. They think they have the answers for their, her life. They think they understand and know what she should do, but they don't. But what would happen if they followed Christ's example? What if they let the kind of love that God has for us lead the way? They might bring flowers or dinner to her, volunteer to take the kids to a movie so she can have some alone time. And what if we listen with our two ears and expressions of love like, sweetie, this is really hard. I love you. I have confidence in you. Or how can I support you right now? Or even when we're worried, because sometimes we are about the decisions we're seeing our friends or family making. How about just saying, I'm worried about the decision you make, you're making, and I love you. Sometimes all it takes is a note or text of love and support. My friend said she really needs love and compassion right now. She's figuring things out in this new scary place, but she knows her main job right now, she, one thing she does know is, is it's time to give her children as much love as she possibly can. We can't fix other people's lives, but we can be there with empathy. Most of us don't understand empathy. We didn't learn it in school, that's for sure. It's not giving advice no matter how much we love the other person. It's not fixing things for them. It is imagining that person's situation as if we were walking in their shoes. Like Jesus talks about in Matthew 38, to love your neighbor as yourself. Since we don't know someone else's complete story or what God's wisdom is for them, empathy and love wins. So while your friend is doing life and learning, stumbling, all those things, be kind. Enjoy them. Love them in that moment. In their process, they may decide to dance in the rain in their cowboy boots. So I'm saying, dance with them. There's one more person who gets the most judging, and it happens all the time, and we all do it. It's that person in the mirror. I know you hear it. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. My kid messed up, so I must be a bad parent. I'm too old to do that. The list goes on and on. 
Those stories we tell ourselves over and over again make our life. I have someone who loves me, loves to tell me she can't do what I'm doing because she's old. And that's real for her. So she stopped doing a lot of things, things that she sees me doing. I always wonder if she remembers I'm considerably younger or older than she is. Is this for real for her? Our words matter. Instead, pretend you're talking to a sweet little four-year-old or watching a four-year-old. What if you overheard that little four-year-old saying, I'm so stupid, no wonder I don't have any friends. I don't know about you, but I would scoop them up into a huge hug and share as many loving things as I could think of and let them know how proud I am of them. That person that we're scooping up is us, and God is that way with us. So maybe it's time we remember we were born to love and be loved. I believe loving kindness starts with God. And then like a warm, lovely shower, that love comes down to us, fills us, and through us to our families, friends, and community and to our world. I believe it's our mission to remove the walls and obstacles that block the love of God, our source. So what can we do? First, I want to acknowledge we've all been living in a storm, and that, takes, and that makes things even more challenging. People are scared, they're more critical, and some are escalating, escalating their discontent to a hurricane. Realize Every storm runs out of rain. We can inject love and empathy by putting ourselves in someone else's shoes to move our mind from the hurricane to the eye of the storm where things are calm, where you may feel God's love and peace. Anyone here perfect? Uh, I don't see anyone. Mm, nope. Enjoy the wonderfully imperfect person that you are right now. Let go of who you think you're supposed to be and embrace who you really are, the wonderfully imperfect you. Take steps towards living wholeheartedly in love and consideration. Replace those negative messages with gratitude for your being. It takes practice. It does for everyone, no matter where they are on their path. It's like learning any other skill. It gradually removes the walls, blocking love, joy, and your best life. When judging thoughts come about others, remember Paul's words to take every thought captive. I like to think of it as you pick it up. You look at it, examine that thought, and ask yourself, am I judging the situation like, should I run from the lion? Or buy that new couch? In other words, it's just a situation or am I judging the other person just because I don't understand them or am disturbed by their behavior? Can you really love someone and expect them to follow all your advice? Whatever types of shoes they are, just like us, they're wonderfully designed by God. Last but not least, love can come from some of the most special and interesting places. I'm one of those people who likes to park far away and then walk to the st up to the store. I did that this week. And as I walked into the towards the store, I overheard a man on his phone saying, the CIA is after me. They're calling me right now. I was so interested. I love people watching. And people are wonderful. After I was done with my shopping, I was able to get a better look at him. His unused ears, because remember, he's on the phone, and all of his joints were covered with what looked like makeshift bandages out of toilet paper. And the rest of his body, all of his exposed skin, was covered with tape. As I walked to my car, I decided he must be my gift from God. And as I got closer, I overheard him encouraging his friend. You're not alone, and neither am I. God loves this man to the moon and back. And his words of encouragement shine not only through his friend, but also to us. Please pray with me. Thank you, God, for not judging our imperfections, 
but always cheering us on as a loving source who wants the best for us, who always loves us. Help us to let go of these, those things, blocking the flow of your love and joy, and please heal, heal our inner life so that we can genuinely be light for you. Amen.